no other resource is as important for life as is water. Water is what we need to thrive as living organisms. And for a modern society or modern civilization, you need access to water to grow your crops and run your industries and do all the things you like in life. People don't really think about it as a finite resource, and it really is. We don't have any more or less water on the planet today than we did a thousand years ago. We just have more people. And so we need water. Without water, we simply don't have a modern society. Water is a molecule that's made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And it's present on the Earth in different forms. So there's a liquid water. 71% of the surface is covered by water. There is ice and snow, and there's also water vapor in the atmosphere. It's about 1.3 billion cubic kilometers of water. We worry about water availability because uh, this huge quantity of water is not all in the form that's readily available to us for consumption. About 97% of that water is salty. About 2.5% is either locked in ice or really deep underground. So when you go down to surface water, meaning water in the lakes and rivers, that's very easily accessible and cheaply available. And that's only about 0.008% of the total quantity of water on Earth. And that's the water that we're using uh, to provide food, water, and energy to 7 billion people that are on the planet today. And by 2050 or so, it'll be 9 billion people. In terms of water use, we are um, very wasteful. If you look at water use per capita in the U.S., we're using about 10 times of what people in U.K. use, and I think Canada is about two-thirds of that use. What is important to keep in mind is that of all of the water that we need to live in dignity by Western standards, only 0.1% is used for drinking. And if you include other domestic uses like cooking and bathing and so on, this direct human consumption is only like two to 3% of the total water that we need. We also use water indirectly. It's in the cotton in our blue jeans. It's in the food that we eat in our home. It's in the cooling of the power plants that give us electricity. And that water adds up to be many hundreds of gallons of water per day. So there's much more water that we use every day out of sight, out of mind, embedded in our products and services and our lifestyle than in the water we use through our taps and shower heads and spigots at home. But the numbers add up, they're pretty dramatic. Water is constantly being recycled and replenished. The water from the oceans is evaporated and it tends to migrate towards the land. Most of the precipitation occurs on the land and that causes runoff, and that's what causes rivers and causes lakes. And then that water on the land might store as ice or snow on top of a mountain, or might flow down as rivers back into the oceans where the cycle continues again. Water is contained within the cycle. Water is not created nor destroyed for the most part. It's powerful, it's immense, it never stops. We only withdraw about 10% of the fresh water runoff on the planet. So in theory, there should be plenty of fresh water for meeting all of our needs, but there isn't. Unfortunately, water is often very scarce in many places. 80 to 85% of the world's population lives in relatively scarce water areas. So even though there's water abundance, it often feels like there's water scarcity that the water is either in the wrong form, the wrong place, or the wrong time. So it's either the wrong form, like salt water, or it's the wrong place, maybe on top of a mountain, or far away, or deep below ground, or it's available at the wrong time, which is like the monsoons in India, where you get all your fresh water in one month, but not the other 11 months. It reminds me of what uh, Samuel Coolidge uh, used to say with his uh, rhyme of the ancient mariner, water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. 
Unfortunately, providing clean water in an affordable and reliable fashion is becoming harder due to three things. Number one is increasing demand due to both population growth and economic growth. The second one is increased pollution. Pollution is becoming harder and more complex to mitigate. And the third one is climate change. That may cause, for example, differences in the frequency of precipitation in the location where precipitation is more intense or more scarce. And it can certainly can give rise to prolonged droughts, flooding, and extreme events like a storm surge and so on, exacerbating freshwater scarcity. Some research says that up to 80% of the world is within a few weeks of having severe water stress. That we live close to oceans or rivers and then one major drought or flood or other event puts those people under water stress and we'll all be affected by that. And many people in a location that has a lake or plenty of water, or at least it looks like they have plenty of water, might not understand the issues of water scarcity even though it impacts them. We export food, we import food, so there is this complex network of embedded water in that import and export of food. And there are often conflicts among countries and among regions because of the water rights issues in neighboring countries and neighboring regions. And if those other locations have to dig deeper wells to get the water or spend more money and energy to get the water or to move the water thousands of miles like they do in China or to desalt the oceans, which is very expensive and energy intensive, then it raises the cost of the economy. It raises the cost of doing business, it raises the cost of things even in your part of the world that might have plenty of water. And so we're all subject to what's happening around the world on the global hydrologic cycle. Really the big elephant on the table, the sectors that we need to address are those that consume the most water. And those are agriculture and energy. We use water to get energy, we use energy to get water, we use energy and water to get food. And now with biofuels made from corn, we're talking about using food for energy. More and more we're talking about the water energy nexus, recognizing that water is an essential ingredient in most of the energy production technologies that we use today. And conversely, energy is one of the most expensive and essential elements of producing and moving water. So when we talk about the water energy nexus, that's what we're talking about. More and more, we're starting to see people talk about the food water energy nexus. And I think that is the essential discussion. If we're gonna find a way for nine billion people to live on this planet and have adequate access to food, water, and energy, we're gonna to have to understand the interrelationships between all of those things. Ensuring a future where there's little or no water scarcity is, under the status quo, very difficult. Water plans that are sort of laid out by state agencies identify water deficits almost across the board as we go forward. And it naturally begs the question, is there a better way? There are solutions. We don't have to stay on a business as usual path where things get worse. We can actually take action and improve our relationship with water and other resources. We've got a lot of work to do when it comes to using water efficiently. If we could just reclaim most of that inefficiently used water, we would have enough water for nine billion people on this planet. We're not trying to pick who gets the water, we're trying to optimize the use of water. So this isn't about cities picking a fight with agriculture or agriculture picking a fight with energy and industry. We have to figure out how we can provide water for all three of those uses globally in such a way that doesn't pit one use against another. Part of that is getting data on, well, how much is there and how much do we use? And part of it is building a cultural mindset or policies or market forces or technologies that help us manage it better. Ensuring a, a secure global water future is uh, sort of the ultimate and difficult problems to solve. We really have two options. We either avoid taking water, withdrawing fresh water faster than nature replenishes it. Or we can take advantage of advanced technologies, policies, and market forces to promote conservation and to enable recycling and reuse. 
our organization has done a global analysis on whether or not nine billion people and nature can thrive simultaneously. And we've reached the conclusion that the answer to that question is yes. But it's gonna take some hard work. We're gonna to have to think very hard about how we grow food on this planet. We have to be thinking about energy and industry. And of course, our growing cities have to think completely differently about their relationship with nature. I think we're moving in the right direction, but perhaps not fast enough. We need not just technology or policy or market forces. We also need, in a way, a change of attitude that can only be brought about by a change in heart where we will have to meet at the convergence of technology, policy, and market forces to ensure that water is not such a major limiting factor to human capacity. And it's certainly within our power. It is our duty and our right to achieve this future.